Hey, what's up? This is your girl, Taylor Wild, reminding all my wild ones to like and subscribe the Wild on YouTube and podcast. It means a hell of a lot to us and the Wild on team because we don't have any major sponsorship. So we rely on all your likes and subscriptions. It only takes a second. Please do it. She is an American mixed martial artist who competes in the Ultimate Fighting Championship Women's Featherweight Division. She grew up playing many sports from basketball, softball, volleyball, running cross country, to always wanting to box. She graduated from high school as a secretary of the National Honor Society with many athletic and academic scholarships. She never played sports on a collegiate level due to a broken back from a freak snowboarding accident. So how did she end up on UFC's Ultimate Fighter? Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, my girl, Raquel Pennington. So what do you know about professional wrestling? Let's talk, let's not talk about MMA for a minute. What do you know about professional wrestling? Well, I've seen that you're a professional wrestler. <laughs> Yay! That counts. Counts. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, honestly, like I really haven't watched professional wrestling since I was a kid. I used to be really into uh what was it? Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, uh what was his name? Kane? No. Yeah, Kate. Yeah. Yeah. And so back then, um, but other than that, I mean, not too much. I haven't watched it and then uh I think the last bit of wrestling that I've actually watched was midget wrestling. Oh, <laughs> that was just a couple months ago. <laughs> Did you see it live, or this is something you yeah, saw online? online. Oh, 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 do tell where. Um, so they actually came here to Colorado, and they were at one of the little like bars, and my aunt asked me if we wanted to join. She was like, "Do you want to go to some res- wrestling?" And I was like, "Sure." We get there, and it's like a bunch of midgets, and I was like, "Oh my gosh." And then uh, it was just, it was super funny, you know, they like, um, they did all their different roles and everything. And one of them, I don't know his actual name, but he was like, they call him 25 cent because he's <laughs> short, but he looked like 50 cent. So his little walkout music was in the club and it was just, uh, it was really entertaining. That's amazing. There, there is like a, a circuit still. So for anyone that's going to lose their shit uh, about like, uh, you know being politically correct midget wrestling is called midget wrestlers by small people so we're not being derogatory that's what they call themselves in wrestling so everyone fucking relax um they even have shirts that say midget lives matter which is the truth all right (laughs) i have one they gave me one (laughs) please wear it out to your next big fight (laughs) yes (laughs) so um no real connection except to the classic era of professional wrestling. How did you find MMA? Honestly, uh, MMA was kind of a joke. Uh, there was one point I grew up being a huge tomboy. Um, yep. I've done sports since I was five, done everything that you can absolutely think of. And then I think around like, I want to say 12, 12 or 13, I asked my parents if I could box. Yeah. And they told me they were like, no, you're way too pretty and your teeth are too nice. We're not paying for that. So <laughs> fair. I just continued like fighting my guy cousins, picking on my brother. And like, that's where I think that like grittiness came from. Mm-hmm. And then um, my senior year, I broke my back snowboarding, couldn't take any of my athletic scholarships. Uh, so I took an academic scholarship to the, the university here in Colorado. And I was kind of just going through rehab, trying to get back in shape and the first team I started with, they were training in a little yoga studio at the okay. gym on those little like quarter inch puzzle mats. Oh, yeah. And it just looked it looked really intense. I've never seen MMA before that. So they were just like throwing each other around that night with judo and wrestling. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they were going into jujitsu. And I was like, hmm. So I told my mom, I was like, I'm gonna go do that. And honestly, I think she just thought it would be something 
good to get going with again. So she's like, let's go talk to the coach. We went in, talked to him next day. uh, He was like, come in, join. Went in the next day. He handed me some gloves, some hand wraps. And I was like, um, what do I do with these? (laughs) I had no idea how to even wrap my hands. And, um, ended up, uh, my first training session ever was sparring. And I honestly just fell in love with it. So I got into it, started training and realized I was pretty good at it. Fought my first fight four months later. And here I am almost 13 and a half years later, 13 years. So to go back to it, though, so how exactly did you break your back? Snowboarding. Okay. Uh, I like, live in the life in Colorado. Were, were, were you just like, was it a freak accident? Were you doing a sweet jump? Like, You know, you... I wish there was this really cool, like, it's really irritating because we actually just got done playing in the terrain park mm-hmm. and we were grinding on all the rails, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. And we were like, all right, let's just go get some runs in. We happened to start leaving the park and... I was fixing my glove yeah. and the front end of my board hooked on some ice, spun uh-huh. me around and it was game over from there. And it was crazy. Cause like I immediately like popped up, it was a reaction. And when I popped up, um, my leg just gave out on the right side. So oh, I like God. face planted and I, and then all the pain started coming in and I was like, something's not right. So I actually started like dragging myself out over to the side. Um, and my buddy, about 20 minutes later, he uh, was walking back up the hill. He took his board off and was walking. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened across the way that um, uh, ski patrol happened to be looking in the binoculars and they seen it. So he was already making his way over to me. And uh, yeah, that so. Wow. No cool story. Just, you know, That's you know, glove. It's usually the way. It's like, how'd you blow your back yeah. out? Sneezed. <laughs> so, yeah, <right? laughs> I've done it, unfortunately. Um, oh, actually, it was, it was my neck. neck. It was my neck. It was just like you, you know, know, for, for all, all the years. Of... Yeah. <laughs> like, what happened? I think it's because I actually tried to hold it back. Like I was uh, in yeah. a public. Let's not talk about it. Let's not talk about our cool injuries. Let's talk about like other things. <laughs> all right, all right. Sounds good. Sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> um, but. That's a, I imagine, a long rehabilitation period from breaking your back. How did you keep yourself mentally grounded in that time? You say you lost your academic scholarship, or excuse me, your athletic scholarships. Well, I went a little crazy, honestly. And then on top of that, living at home still, my like I had the whole basement. Mm -hmm. So my room and everything was down there. Had my own living room and just whole setup. And so I couldn't even basically go down to my area. Mm -hmm. I had to sleep upstairs and... You know, I mean, having to be in a back brace and then on crutches and then just things drastically changing. um, It took a pretty huge mental toll on me. Like that was the first time that I really like I've been through some stuff in life, but for something to just kind of change when you have like these hopes and dreams, because I always wanted to be a basketball star. Okay. And so then uh, it was really tough. And, you know, I got to a point that I was actually really frustrated. um, And my mom was just like, you know, she's always been super supportive, encouraging my entire family. And uh, it didn't matter what anybody was telling me, you know, like I was just, uh, I didn't want to hear any of it. And then one day she jumped in the shower and I was like, all right, I am going downstairs. <laughs> and like karma bit me in the ass right away because I attempted to go down the stairs and I actually like slipped with the crutch. So I went tumbling down the stairs, messed things up even more, had to go back to the hospital. It was this whole ordeal. Got lectured some more, and then I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't know. All my injuries have honestly, like, now that I'm older, they've really taught me patience. But that was uh, that was tough, and I just started finding, like, the good and the little things. Right. That's all I could do at that time, you know? Yeah, for sure. So. so, like, a big thing for me is I've been through a lot my whole life, but especially in the last year, I've been through – some really trying times and I think I've really dove deep into spirituality for the first time um, because I've always done so much with the physical and you know being an overachiever and doing contact sports a lot of the times that's a trauma response Um, have you done anything spiritually to keep yourself grounded whether it's like you know incorporating meditation into your training or anything for the mental aside from the physical Yeah. So, you know, everybody's like, oh, fighting super physical, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it's an extremely physical sport. But I always tell people, 
it's 10% physical, 90% mental. And so I think it's extremely important to work on our mental states. And for that, you know, I mean, being an athlete my whole life, I've done sports psychology, which really helps me. But then uh, a big thing for me is I love journaling. So ah. it like gives me time to like sit with my thoughts and it's amazing what you can write down. And then if you yeah. go back and read it just even a day or a week later, it's like, what was I thinking? We're like, <laughs> it's really cool to see that. So then I do some of that. And then, um, you know, I have like a, I love doing, um, sometimes I'll just like kind of go sit in like the sauna or steam rooms yeah. and I just put myself into like different mental states of my own type of meditation and just kind of really focusing on those things. And then I actually started, so I have a little bit of Native American in me oh, and okay. um, I went and did a sweat lodge <gasps> to l- last weekend, actually. Cool. It was with some Indians and like going through their whole thing. And, you know, I had to put a like a long like skirt on and then like the shawl over me. Oh, wow. And then I learned like the traditions and like the beating of the drums and the chanting and all the different things that they do. And so like that was something that like, I don't know, a lot of people don't like everybody believes in their own things. And sometimes when you take it to a spiritual level, everybody's like, "Mm," and they get all, but I can tell you going through that, like, I don't know what it was just like centering with myself. I don't know if like the beating of the drums, like just the entire environment itself. But like, it just felt extremely powerful to me. And like, so that's actually something that I kind of like want to incorporate into just my life. Yeah, that's really good. I think people get like, they they think like all the woo woo things. They think like the tarot cards and the crystals and spirituality is really different than religion because religion you're looking at a higher power and spirituality is just about being the best you, being the highest version of you and being centered. So um, I think that's really cool. I've been looking into that myself. You know, being Canadian, we have lots of reserves. There's a lot of like sweat tents and people that do um, incorporate. Uh, people outside their tribes, outside their creeds. So uh, do you want to tell me a little bit about your experience there? Like how was it like a few hours? Was it a day? Yeah. So actually I got there um, in the morning Mm -hmm. and honestly didn't even finish till it was like got there around 10, didn't finish until I think it was like around five. Mm -hmm. And basically they do, um, you know, they do four sessions. So you go like into the TP and stuff and uh, like before you enter and then um, before you exit, you always have to say to all my relations and you can't walk in there. You have to crawl. And um, basically once you commit to being in there, like you can't exit. And so it's extremely, it was pretty intense because like, I don't like, I'm not claustrophobic. I like, I don't know. But it was just, it was, um, it was different because when, once everybody like came in and whatnot and, you know, so, okay. Originally when I arrived, they do the stage and it's like brushing off, like you're like cleansing yourself and cleansing the demons and all the different things and whatnot. Well then, um, you change and stuff and then you start the ritual and it's with the drum. And so you take pretty much like some tobacco and you go around the drum and you give prayer to the drum. Then after that, the chants start. So the chanting went on for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then mind you, like there's a big fire pit and that's where they're heating up the stones and they have like buffalo skulls surrounding things and everything. And then you have your TP and stuff. And then, like I said, once you enter in there, they say that like, if you're struggling, it's because you're not praying hard enough. You're not releasing everything that your body's holding on to. So you need to give it to creator. You need to give it to mother nature. Right. And like, you know, everybody's like, oh, creator's God and this, that or another. But like, that's not what creator is for Native Americans and stuff. And so it was really cool because, like I said, I mean, I've never been claustrophobic. But for some reason, when I got in there, I was like, I don't know about this. <laughs> like, I don't know what was going on with my mental state, but I was like, mm-hmm. whoa. And then on top of that, they started bringing in the stones and they do four sessions and the four sessions you don't know how long they're going to last. Mm-hmm. Um, but the first one is like praying for thanks and like acceptance and everything. The second session is praying for the world. The third session is your own prayer. And the fourth session is um, praying again for 
thanks and then uh, acceptance of your prayers. Mm -hmm. And it's to the north, south, east, and west. So that's why there's the four sessions. And, um, you know, when they got ready to close it and it was going pitch black in there, the original, like the start of it, I was like, okay, I can't breathe around smoke. And it started getting really smoky. Yep. And as it goes on, you know, I mean, they're throwing water on it. Right. That's where it's like the stones are heating up and everything. But when it first started, I was like, okay, I feel claustrophobic and I can't breathe. So Oof. I like kind of panicked and they were like, you already committed to being in here. And um, the little like elderly Indian lady next to me, she was like, calm yourself. She's like, find grounding. Like you can do it. And she just kept getting really encouraging and you're not supposed to talk in there, but okay. I was having a moment. Yep. She saw you. She saw you. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, I kind of found just like a cold spot on the ground and I put my hand there and like pretty much grounded myself. And then when they closed um, it off and it got pitch black in there, I closed my eyes and I experienced like seeing a little bit of light, mm -hmm. but then I was just listening. And then when they started playing the drums and then doing everything, I don't know. It was just, it was a really different experience, but it was just like, by the time it was said and done, I just felt for one, like, okay, if you've ever gotten high or whatever, mm -hmm. like it wasn't like my mind was high, but it was like, my body was like so carefree. And so just like, I don't know. I felt so free, but almost like a body high. Like I was that relaxed yeah. and my mind just had so much clarity. It was amazing. What a beautiful experience. It was amazing. Yeah. I, I again, I it's something I've been interested in, but were you exhausted after it or were you like like No. Did you have, no I, like, you were toast. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't like this like drained. Yeah. Like it was just like I felt so calm, so free, mm -hmm. so relaxed that like I didn't feel like I didn't feel like talking, like I didn't have any extra energy for like the other stuff. Like I was just like legit, like at peace in the moment. Okay. So all I wanted to do was listen to like super chill music. Yep. And then that night, like just slept like a baby. That's great. Or like a log. <laughs> you don't sleep hard. Oh, my baby didn't sleep. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think he slept through the night for the first time when he was probably about like two and a half years old. So oh, yeah, that's that's a long journey. Children are your karma. So, you know, he's healthy, he's happy, but boy, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Now, circling back, so you grew up a tomboy, you grew up fighting your cousin. So how many, like, non-official fights would you say you had before you got into the world of MMA? <laughs> so I actually got into two official fights, like, with other people besides family members <laughs> and like um the funny part is I actually my first fight the girl kept bullying me like all kinds of all the time she was just bullying me and you know I never I've always been the person that like you know I accept everybody and whatnot until mm -hmm. like you give me a reason not to and I've hated I've been a um ambassador against bullying and stuff mm. and so, you know, like I was the person at school that, you know, I would take in the people that they would consider the outcasts or the people that were always getting bullied. And, um, you know, I just always focused on my academics and focused on sports. And this one girl, her name was Raquel mm -hmm. as well. Oh, and she would, <laughs> yeah, she would actually always pick on me and just kept like trying to fight me. And it was always something. And, you know, she was just like, at that time, it was like my little boyfriend that I had and, she was, I was like, you know, you can have him like I, this. I'm not fighting over this. Yeah. Well, then it was just like, you know, I was walking through the halls and she would like slam me up against the locker and do stuff. And I would never get aggressive. Really? And I would just listen. Yeah. And then like her and her friends would come corner me in the bathroom. Like it was always something. And then finally I'm a person and I could only take so much. Sure. And I was a uh, 13 years old recruited onto a 17, 18 year old traveling basketball team. Uh, we were training at the Olympic training center at the time. And my best friend went to Skate City. That's when Skate City was cool. Mm -hmm. So we'd go skating on the weekends. <laughs> nice. And uh, yeah, my best friend was there and she texted me and told me she was there. And I just asked my mom, I said, hey, can you take me over there so I can go see my friend? So we swung by, but I just rolled up in there and I was like, I've had enough. And I went at her and <laughs> basically her and four of her little friends, they jumped me. 
I got the better end of the deal. So I ended up having to go to mediation. I had to pay for medical bills. I got in trouble by my mom. Oh, <laughs> like, shit. So it got really, really real. real. It was a real deal. And oh, so shit. I was like, well, I'm kind of good at defending myself. And then I got into one other fight at school. And the principal was just like, I am so confused because you're such a good kid. And I was like, I just can't deal with these people. Yeah. So it was a, uh, those were my two. But then, like I said, I mean, my guy cousin growing up, he's, they call us Chippendale <laughs> and we're five months apart. He's older, Aww. but he would just always do stupid stuff. And like, we were just always picking on each other, constantly fighting. And that, like, I can't tell you the amount of times we fought. Really? <laughs> cannot tell you so he was your like foundational kind of fighting partner yeah but yeah he uh he's the one that like i think we would take our anger and emotions out on each other my uh my nana and papa which is my grandparents they always like collected um cactuses so she had like a little cactus garden surrounding her big tree in the yard yeah and then really cool stones going around it from different places of hikes. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times we sat there at my grandparents' house and they had tweezers just picking them oh. out because we would throw each other in them in the middle of our fights. <laughs> he got on my nerves one time. He kept talking crap and we just got done playing catch and uh, hitting some of the balls for baseball. Yeah, I just grabbed the bat and whacked him in the face, knocked out his front teeth. Like, that's how bad we were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you had a, a decent fight history before going pro. Um, good. So <laughs> what was the biggest difference? I know this sounds totally stupid because professional wrestling, you know, it's half entertainment, half kind of like sparring, let's say. Like we, we go at like 75, 80% for lack of better term. But what was the biggest difference between being in like a, a fight with the heat of the moment in high school or in your 20s and then being in a professional fight like where does your mind go that would you say that you would say is different in those two scenarios well mentally um you know fighting now like I don't fight with emotion um mm -hmm. I fight with skill and technique and uh there's a big difference as opposed to back then it was just like out of emotion and reacting um then of course gloves mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't have gloves then have gloves now. <laughs> right um and so, yeah, I mean, now it's just like, it's based off of technique and competition as opposed to back then. It was just like, who's going to be the last one standing here? Right, right. So it's like uh, essentially your business, your business mind versus just swinging for the bleachers. Yeah, for sure. I think it's interesting that there's no emotion or, or very little emotion involved besides wanting to come out on top um, when it comes to MMA UFC style fighting because it looks so legit in the way that you know when you do guys do your weigh-ins and your how much of that is like professional wrestling by the way are, are, are a lot of the times you guys homies and you're just like okay this is this is where we have to show that we've got you know real heat um, so everybody always asks you know they're like how scripted is it there's no script in mm -hmm. MMA. Like this is genuinely, you know, everybody reacts so different. Um, a lot of us met because of this sport. So right. there are a lot of relationships there, but when at the end of the day, like we're meeting and if we're meeting the same people or like people in our same weight division, like mm -hmm. there's a chance that we're going to see each other across the octagon. And so, you know, a lot of people like the animosity builds or emotions build or just during fight week, like you have to find ways to emotionally separate yourself. So right the shit talking come in, comes into play and everything. And everybody's so different. Some people really like thrive off of like the hype and like getting themselves into that gear, right. but nothing is scripted at all. Like okay. it's just however people act. It's, and it's just real transparent. Like this is how you're going into the fight. This is who you are. That's really uh, interesting because yeah. I think that's the part, the entertainment aspect that people wonder, like how much is prodded, how much is, you know, encouraged act this way or whatever, but that's all organic. Yeah, it's super organic. And I mean, you have these guys and stuff, you know, you take a lot, a lot of young athletes too, who a lot of people, they come from nothing or different things. Everybody's background so different, but then you have young kids who all of a sudden they get put on the biggest platform in the world and they're making lots of money and that alone can change people. And so they just start seeing themselves in a different way and start acting mm -hmm. certain ways. And like I said, I mean, there's other people that as soon as the big lights go on and the cameras come out, 
people like to act a certain way. So it really all just depends on the individual and who you are and mm-hmm. whatnot. I'm just the type I've never, I've never believed in talking shit for one. Cause at the end of the day, like if I sit here and run my mouth all day and then I happen to have an off night, like the fight's going to speak for itself. But if right. I have to have an off night, Oh, here we go. Now you got a whole new fight because social media, everything else. And then you got people coming on on that. And it's just, uh, I mean, that's what makes the entertainment, right? Yeah. So just whatever place you're willing to put yourself in, I guess. And have you been in that situation where you've had to have a, a big fight against someone that you would consider a good friend? Yeah. So um, when I fought Misha Tate, uh, we have a huge storyline there. Um, Misha is one of the like most well-known names in women's MMA. I mean, she like basically built the path like her and other ones for the women's divisions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we went from, I knew who she was. She was actually like one of the second fights I ever seen in MMA. Um, and then, you know, I would see her around one of the promotions I was fighting for. And it was just kind of like a little bit of like idolization there. And then it went from that to, I ended up on the ultimate fighter. So she was my coach. And then after that, she asked me to um, come out, come out and help her train for her second fight against Ronda Rousey. So then we became friends and then all of a sudden we had to fight each other. So then we were opponents and then, you know what I mean? So there was that relationship. And then when I fought Amanda, like, Amanda and I grew in the sport together. I've known her for years and everything. And, um, you know, we've always supported each other and whatnot. And we've always talked. And every time we would get together at certain events, if she was there and she like adores my family and my family adores her. So then we ended up signing up for the world title together. And so, yeah, there was, there's been some relationships there, but it's kind of one of those things where it's like, "Eh." and then, I actually did fight one fight um, when I was still on Invicta. Mm-hmm. I fought against Leslie Smith, and Leslie and I actually used to train together. We started our careers together at the same exact gym. So oh, we were wow. training partners. And then she ended up moving to California, and we got signed up to fight. And I was just like, okay, cool. But then, like, you know, it turned into the whole thing of, like, she just started talking crap about my family. She was saying, like, she just went deep with it. She took it to wow. a personal level. And that was the first time I experienced something like that. And so like I fought out of emotion in that. And then Mm. that was the first time I experienced an adrenaline dump from having like all the adrenaline from competition, all the emotions that Charlie carried going into a fight. And then the emotions I had towards her as a person and just everything like that first round, I just came out like, wow, it was so much emotion. And then as soon as the first round was over, like, there was nothing like being trapped in an octagon and my brain is like telling my body to go and my body literally couldn't function because it just an adrenaline dump like I shut down wow wow how did you like what where did your mind go from there were you just like fuck 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 or I was just confused I remember being in front of her and it like I felt like my arms were like a thousand pounds each and I couldn't get them to go I didn't even really like want to stand up and I remember her taunting me in the fight. She started throwing her arms out because, like, I wouldn't come at her. But, like, for me, my mind, I was like, let's go. Like, what are you doing? Punch. Yeah. And, like, my body just wouldn't do anything. Wow. It was and crazy. It, and is that something that happens to a lot of fighters at least once in their career? Like, is it a hard lesson that you have to experience? You know, I've talked to quite a bit of athletes, and they've experienced that, too. And the crazy part is, is, for me, I didn't realize how much that was playing a part and mm-hmm. it added emotions. Cause you know, I'm, I've always been like a person of cardio, all this stuff and like crazy, like endurance. But for some reason I got this fear and it's almost like the body holding on to trauma, you know? Right. And so I got this fear and I was like, I'm not in shape. And that's always something I question. And my coaches are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like there's days that you're sitting here freaking training for two and a half, three hours straight. And all we need you for is a maximum of maybe 15 minutes in a world title fight, 25 minutes. So like wow. you're more than in shape. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. And so that's what I had to learn to like overcome with things. And, mm-hmm. you know, I talked to, it's more common than what I even realized. Yeah. So. Well, I, I experienced that a little bit myself. Obviously it's not on a higher scale, but when you're, 
you know, you, you make your way to the ring and you go to jump and it's like your legs are literally made of cement and you're like, no, 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 I know how to do this. I've done this before. And it's just like, yeah. there's a total disconnect and it's terrifying, especially in your case where someone could legitimately knock your block Take off. your head off? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a little, a little, a little, little, little ris riskier. Um, well, that's really interesting. I'm so glad we finally had some time to talk. I really appreciate you opening up about your spirituality and some of your uh, pre pre professional life fights. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Behind <laughs> the scenes. Yeah. Well, anyways, it was. You know what? I'm going to end on one last question. And it's just the reason I started this podcast was to really highlight female professional wrestlers and the intimate side of them that people can't really, there's not a lot of information about female fighters, period, uh, besides who you are, where you're from, how old you are, and your weight class. Is there anything our listeners could learn from this interview that they wouldn't be able to find via Google about Raquel? Um, well, the behind the scenes fighting. Yes. <laughs> the things we talked about. Um, honestly, you know, I mean, for the most part, like I'm a pretty private person, but then there's mm -hmm. been parts of my lives that like I've made transparent. So if people follow me on social media and stuff, I mean, I try to put it out there with like my lifestyle and just being down to earth, super outgoing. Like I'm super adventurous. And like, I mean, I don't know. I like can't really I mean obviously I have 33 years behind me yeah that's you're so, so just throw, just throw, <laughs> yeah right <laughs> feel it these days I'm 36 relax <laughs> we'll throw out a fun fact I was actually okay. uh I don't know if anybody really knows it I've spoke about it a couple times but um let's see I've broken a ton of bones obviously but I was actually born with a broken collarbone that wasn't discovered until I was three and a half weeks old and then the night before my last day of kindergarten, uh -huh. um, I actually broke my other collarbone. So if you touch my collarbones, still to this day, I freak out. Like, it's the weirdest feeling. I don't want nobody touching my collarbone. Interesting. So that's something fact. that a lot of people may not know. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. Good sign off. Yeah.